is probably one of the most depressing, heart-wrenching photos I've ever seen. Native American children taken from their families, put into school to assimilate them into white society. A whole entire generation of Native American children completely lost by ethnic cleansing and genocide, by men and women professing to be working on behalf of God. The priests raped many of these children. What is anybody supposed to do with this? Nobody alive today is responsible for this. This needs to be a part of the curriculum of history, along with the correct perspectives on many other aspects of our emergence as a nation. So according to your narrative, there are two groups of humans, white men and victims. I take offense to the original post and the whole aggressive and derogatory attitude of what was written. It's disingenuous and not even true what he is saying. If the anger makes us uncomfortable, then we need to examine why. One of the privileges of the dominant society is writing history to protect ourselves from looking in the mirror. Then history simply becomes propaganda. History is what it is. No undoing, no lessons to be learned here, just useless knowledge. They wanted to destroy our identity. And they put us on these boarding schools. I'm one of them that they put in these boarding schools. Destroy the language. Mm -hmm. Destroy the songs. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, you couldn't sing any native song. You couldn't speak any native language. The vernacular would be English, and English only. That's how they wrote it up. This is a hidden history. And so, so many people don't know this history. You know, this country, people are, don't even know about boarding school trauma. Kids are not taught about it in the schools. After Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn, the U.S. government had a serious Indian problem with the Northern Plains tribes, especially the Lakota. There was serious talk of a military campaign of complete extermination of all Indians who were resisting being forced onto the reservations. But that plan was rejected in government circles, as plans often are, because it would cost too much. Instead, attention turned to a retired army officer who had undertaken an education experiment with Indian prisoners at Fort Marion in Florida. His name was Colonel Richard Henry Pratt. Pratt offered Indian prisoners of war from earlier conflicts their freedom in return for submission to a program of assimilation and taught them English, various trades, and marching drills. Most of the prisoners complied, if only to secure their freedom, and Pratt touted his program a success and petitioned the government for the authority to expand it. Pratt considered himself a friend to the Indian, in contrast to those advocating extermination, and believed Native Americans could become useful citizens if they could only be civilized. This would require them to renounce their culture and tribal way of life and convert to Christianity. But convincing the Indian to abandon his spirituality would prove to be a difficult task. The missionaries handed out crosses and were shocked to learn that the natives wore them as symbols of the four cardinal points of their religion and they were reluctant to give that up for one locked in a black book that they couldn't read and seemed full of contradiction. It is a good book, I am sure. Why does the white man not follow it? If there is only one true religion, why do the Methodists and the Baptists and the Blackcoats all fight each other? 
I do not want your heaven when I die, and please keep your hell. There'll be no room for Indians. It'll be too full of white bad hearts. Pratt and his advocates in Washington were convinced that the only way to fully conquer the Indian was to kill everything that was Indian inside of them. And the phrase, kill the Indian and save the man, became the mantra of his movement. Having had little success in the native communities, they decided to focus on the children and separate the children from their families starting at about age five. The children would be turned over to religious groups for re-education in boarding schools. Children who refused to go risked having food rations withheld from their communities and their parents imprisoned. The flagship of these boarding schools was the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Thanks to Luther Standing Bear's book, My People the Sioux, we know about that journey that that first group took from, from the Dakota Territory to Carlisle. They traveled by train, and um, one young boy described that process as traveling on a moving house. And that group of children were, had never been on a train. And when they got on the train and were traveling, they sat very still. They were afraid to lean in either direction for fear that that moving house would tip over and that they would perish. So, you know, they were very uncomfortable and, and scared. They arrived with blankets. The blankets were taken away. So these kids got stripped away, and often at a very early age, age six, and the schools were residential, so the kids were sent there to live, pulled out of their home community from everything they knew. Kids were sent with medicine bundles, things to protect them and keep them safe, burned in a fire. Luther Standing Bear describes the process of cutting their hair and how in the Lakota way, that was a sign of mourning. So they knew something had been lost, something had died. Kids had their heads shaved when they arrived, and the one of the things that was really powerful, a lot of the children when they were removed from their homes, when they had their head shaved, some of the narratives that came at, back was they thought that their parents were killed, and that's because it's a sign of mourning in some of our communities to cut your hair means that someone has died. So children were very confused. It was clear that it was not just about providing opportunity, it was about eradicating identity. Um, there were harsh physical beatings for the speaking of tribal languages, um, forcible conversions to Christianity. In the late 1800s, the schools were industrial, so kids worked half the day, went to school half the day. Um, a third of the kids developed trachoma, painful eye disease caused by poor hygiene, which is what happens when you have kids digging ditches half the day. They were immediately taught that they would be punished if they spoke their native language. We were taught never to speak a word of Indian, not even a word of Indian, Indian in, at any time during the school time. If we do, they, they, they wash our mouths out with soap and water. They have GI soap, they call them, they're like dial soap, yellow and whitish, they're big squares. He cut one, took his knife out and cut it four ways, and he said, there, chew on this. So he made us chew that soap, chew it, and then he, we spit it out. But that soap, the lye, is that what you call that? Burnt the inside of our mouth. One of the favorite punishments of some of the Jesuits was to take the, the young people, if they were caught speaking their language, and force them to bite down on a very large rubber band and bite down as tight as they could. And then the rubber band would be stretched out as far as they could stretch it without it popping from his mouth and then released. And it was smashed back into his face, or her face. And uh, that was one way they tried to break us from speaking our own language. You talk in Indian in the classroom, they'll... Uh They'll bend the ruler and hit you in the mouth. 
That really hurts. But I keep forgetting I, I talk Indian. And that's when I took me in the room and hit me in the back with, I don't know what it is. I think it's a razor strap. That really hurts. We missed uh, forget and speak Indian while they take us in the room, whip us. Yeah. And so it was cruel. I mean, it's, I don't know. I couldn't understand I, at first, you know. I thought I'd come here to learn and they'd come and use a whip on us, you know. Belt line, they call it the belt line. They they light up on each side and they run this child through, in, through the middle and they all take a whip at that. I've seen a young man's hip bone kicked out of place and it healed like that and they called him Stiffy. I went to a boarding school, I mean a government school, where I still had the opportunity to speak my language. Where a lot of these kids went to Catholic school where they were beaten, you know, when they spoke their language. They broke their little knuckles. Therefore, we almost lost our language because of that, you know, because they stopped them from speaking their, their language. They broke their little spirits. The taking of one's language is actually an act of war because you're saying you can't speak anymore on the way that you understand the world. The heart and soul of any culture is the language. Once the language is gone, you're no longer a people. Do you speak any Lakota? No. No. Do you want to speak or learn it? Yeah. Can you tell me one word? Tantanka. And what does that mean? Buffalo. Um, and do, would you like to learn more? I'll know one more. Okay, what? Igumu. What's that? A cat. A cat. I love that. A whole entire generation of Native American children completely lost by ethnic cleansing and genocide. By men and women professing to be working on behalf of God. The priests raped many of these children. It's disingenuous and not even true what he is saying. But there was also, I mean, I was in a school where there was priests and nuns. First, I was the first one, and I, I heard the screams. And the running away, and the beatings, and the whippings by belts and leather. And, raping. We could hear the cries of the girls being molested at night. I saw the administrator leave at night and go into the boys' dorm. He would come out in the morning. I reported him and I was fired. Someone had stuffed their pea stain sheet in a closet and the nun found it. So the nun made us pee in a bucket. Then she pushed all of our faces into it, one at a time. I said I would never forgive this government for allowing a policy like that to, to be inflicted upon us. And so historical trauma is still with us. Not all boarding school students suffered physical abuse, and some reported positive experiences, even though the indoctrination lasted throughout their lives. So I want to tell you about Maggie Tarbell, because Maggie was the last living female student that we had the opportunity to actually meet and hear her stories about Carlisle. Maggie was 99 years old, and this was in 2000. And we had a book of photographs from the Indian school that she was looking through, and we could see these memories triggered as she looked at the photographs. But we were a couple of white women coming up to the reservation to interview Maggie. So she felt like she had to be on her best behavior and stick to the good, and I'm putting it in quotes, um, 
rules and attitudes that she learned at Carlisle. How was it for you to travel far away from home by yourself? Um, she was only 15 when she came to Carlisle. And she said, oh, it was a long trip and I was really scared. But it was a good school and I got a good education there. Weren't you lonely? Weren't you homesick? And Maggie said, oh, yes, I was so homesick. But it was a good school and I got a good education there. So you can see how the indoctrination came through. You know, even after all these years, Maggie knew that she had to follow the line that she learned at Carlisle. We asked her, what did you do for fun, Maggie? And she said, oh, I used to sneak up into my room late at night and talk India. But it was a good school, and I got a good education there. So even in the best of situations, even in a situation where there's no abuse, there's no sexual abuse, there's no, no real trauma, what kind of an effect would that have on somebody? That is real trauma. No, that's, that's real trauma. I mean, you're, not only were they, you know, like you said, plucked from the bosom of their family and their tiyoshpae, right? Their hair was cut off. That's really not okay culturally. Um, they weren't allowed to speak their own language in the schools. So it was a hugely, they were completely isolated. It's a hugely abusive situation that they were put in. It's like prison, it's prison for kids. The children began to come home damaged with trauma. They had been molested and you can't really tell your grandma about that. You say, you know, grandma, something happened, but you're not going to describe it. So then it gets buried and that's a trauma. That's another layer. And then when you get to be 20, 16, 25, it's still there, it doesn't go away. So then people begin to sedate themselves. Another layer happens where alcohol and drugs comes in. So there's another layer of trauma. And then when you have um, drugs and alcohol, violence enters the picture. Violence comes into the room and then there's another layer. So when children are uh, traumatized by, for example, the people are, are abused, uh, neglected, hurt, injured by the people whom they depend upon for nurturance and um, care. Um, it leaves a lasting legacy. I don't see how it can't. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter and I can't even picture putting her on a train and sending her to Pens uh, Virginia by herself. I can't even picture that. Yes. Reverse the roles and have any mother talk about having her kid being taken away to a place they're never going to, you know, not be allowed out and not be able to speak their language and not be able to wear their familiar clothes. And it's just, you know, it's very clear. The children grew up to be adults. Adults who suffer from mental illnesses and a lack of connection to a culture that never wanted them to leave. These scars are passed down from generation to generation. And in reality, the above picture is close to present times. Loneliness is a form of stress. It's a psychosocial stress experience. So we have conducted uh, two studies now in, in recent years where we were looking at um, the expression of genes inside the human brain in people that had varying degrees of loneliness. Um, and what we saw was that depending on the level of loneliness, there were hundreds if not thousands of genes, in fact about 1,600 genes, that were differently expressed as a function of how lonely they were. And when you look at what is it that these genes do, not only is a lonely person more likely to become depressed, for instance, but they're also more likely to have all kinds of physical um, health problems. They're more likely to have cancer. Uh, they're more likely to develop uh, neurodegenerative diseases. They're more likely to have Alzheimer's. If they do have Alzheimer's, they're more likely to decline more quickly. They're more likely to have inflammatory diseases, heart diseases, all kinds of physical things that one wouldn't really think are much related to how you feel. So how would imposed loneliness or separation impact the individual? Uh, I mean, my intuition would be that 
it would be even worse. I mean, it's one thing to feel lonely, um, but it's another to be forced into loneliness by an external force. And uh, the longer the separation lasts, the more uh, profound the, the, the long-term effects might be. Um, most likely there would be pretty profound effects on the way in which the child would um, grow up being able to socially connect to other people. Um, it could have cognitive effects on brain development, um, could have effects on personality, emotional development. Uh, all of these uh, maturational processes would be impacted by a forced separation. What would happen with multiple traumas accumulating across generations? Intuitively, it would make sense that the damage done by these multiple traumas will also accumulate. At the molecular level, looking at the epigenetic markers on genes. At the physiological level, in terms of stress reactivity. At the brain level, in terms of the neural circuitry, how the brain is wired up and then in terms of behavior and social issues. Uh, uh, perhaps coping skills or ill-adaptive coping skills associated with um, dealing with trauma, uh, which could go into social issues related to alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide, you know, things like that. So all of those things could be amplified by m exposure to multiple traumas across multiple generations. Traditionally, Native people would turn to their spiritual practices and religion and their ceremonies as a path to healing. But these practices were outlawed as well, leaving them cut off from their own culture and spiritual medicine with no resources to help themselves or each other. In fact, the medicine people were often the first ones put in jail or thrown into insane asylums created for troublesome or defiant Indians. These prohibitions would last long after Native Americans were granted citizenship and supposedly with it all the rights under the Constitution, including the right to free worship. That is the foundation of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people's way of life, which was outlawed back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, the Lakotas can go to jail or be killed for practicing their ceremonies and their uh, songs and their dances. So that's why it was almost 100 years keeping it underground. Native Americans would have to wait until 1924 to be granted citizenship, but their right to worship, expressly guaranteed by the Constitution, would not begin to be restored until 1978. Since then, there has been a steady resurgence of Native American culture and pride as the ceremonies came back out into the open. On the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, there is an Honor the Chief's Day and powwow every year on the day that would otherwise be celebrated as President's Day, and similar celebrations and events have begun springing up in other tribal communities. In the last few years, the celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day has been spreading in towns and cities across the U.S., paralleling what had been started in Canada and other countries. Like even in Canada, coming out of their Truth and Reconciliation Commission, pretty much any major event funded by the government will say, you know, welcome to this place. You are in the traditional homeland of the Ojibwe and Dakota, you know, and they'll have a, a few things to say. That doesn't make all the big problems go away, but it, it kind of opens the space. So people have been abused repeatedly as kids, had their identities squashed and told that they were dirty Indians, and people felt like that about themselves. 
And so they would take that shame and hide it or drink it away. But um, the prevalence of alcoholism, domestic violence, sexual abuse, teen suicide, gang involvement on the reservation is a direct repercussion of the reservation system where people are isolated without means, without funds, without resources, and the boarding schools were part of that. In spite of how unfair the world is, I do believe that education can provide a powerful lever to help people get more access to opportunity. The introduction that Native Americans had to modern Western education was as a form of forced assimilation. There is a view amongst a lot of Native people that education means a good, thorough whitewashing. If you can go to school for 13 years in a row and never learn about yourself, the message that you receive through the absent narratives is that you and yours are not important. You and yours are not relevant. You and yours don't matter. And with the Native experience with residential boarding schools, that compounds on top of it. And it feels like, it felt like to me, like the continuation of an age-old assault on our very identity and way of being. Now, how do people react when they feel assaulted? And you get those caveman responses, fight or flight. And all the officials are scratching their heads. How come these Indians have so many discipline problems in, in school? Well, that's fight. How come we got such a big truancy problem with our native learners? Well, that's flight. One of the privileges of the dominant society is writing history to protect ourselves from looking in the mirror. Then history simply becomes propaganda. Yeah, it's kind of appalling that uh, you can go to school for 13 years in a row in America, and the only stuff you learn about native anything are a couple sugar-coated versions of Christopher Columbus in the first Thanksgiving. So with Columbus, um, first of all, you know, he's somebody who was an important figure in history. In the name of King Ferdinand and Isabella, Columbus took the island. There was gold to be brought home, promises to be kept. Since these were the Indies, these must be Indians. Fortunately, Columbus had made preparations for this meeting, and with beads and trinkets, the friendship of the savages was soon won. He had discovered a new world. Our America. If you look at Bartolome de las Casas and his writings, what was really happening on Columbus's uh, second voyage to the Americas, this is a drawing from the first English edition for Bartolome de las Casas' book, in defense of the Indians. And it just simply depicts the gold dust tribute that the Spanish instituted. They said all native people need to bring a hawk's bell, basically a quarter teaspoon of gold dust. Those who fail to do so will have their hands chopped off. The Spanish not realizing that the gold jewelry that people had was primarily acquired in trade from tribes in mainland Mexico. And it was not possible for people to acquire enough gold to meet the tribute, just laying around on the ground, uh, and they cut the hands off of many, many people. Certainly the Spanish took native people as prisoners and often hung them in groups of 13 in honor and reverence for our Redeemer and the 12 apostles, um, burned native people alive, chopped off their hands or hands and feet, um, did summary executions, and committed genocide by any definition of the word. Columbus never set foot in what's now the United States of America, but we have more places named after him than anyone else other than George Washington. And he is seen as an American hero. On the quincentenary, the 500th anniversary of Columbus, um, George Bush the Elder was president at the time and issued a statement that established the Jubilee Commission and talked about the wonderful achievements of this great navigator 
who literally, quote, set an example for us all. Certainly an example that was followed, but not one I'd want my kids to follow. And all of that, you know, if after 500 years we could have said, you know what, there were good things that happened, there were bad things that happened, and we're going to take an honest look at all of them. That would have been different. But that's not the way it was framed. And all too often today, um, there's great resistance to truth-telling in history. So what do we teach about Native stuff? Not a lot. Because there's not much there that's going to prop up that narrative of American exceptionalism. It doesn't resonate and people will resist because to do anything else is to require us as a nation to take a look in the mirror. So what often happens is, like let's say we're trying to develop a school program, there's pushback and resistance because the teacher's thinking, oh, Columbus, if I say this, the Indians are going to get mad. If I say that, the Italians are going to get mad. What am I going to do? As little as possible. Or what, you want me to be attentive to all of the 58 different racial and linguistic groups in this school district? I can't do that. Let's just do this. And you end up building the curriculum, not around the needs of the students or the needs of the nation. You build the curriculum around white comfort. 51% of our students in America are students of color. That's who's here. Of those students, about 60% actually finish high school. And some demographics, like the Native American demographic, finishes high school about 50% of the time. And it is not a recipe for a healthy nation to take the largest group of students in the country and only get up to 60% of them to the finish line with high school. The average annual income for somebody who doesn't finish high school is about $20,000 a year. We should want everyone to finish high school and to go to college because it means they'll be paying taxes and they'll be full load-bearing citizens contributing to society and spending their money in stores and growing the pie for everybody instead of burdens on society. I personally think that they're held up on a pedestal as special and it's rubbed in our face to feel guilty about their past for eternity. Outside of the schools, popular culture, especially movies and TV, has been portraying Native Americans as stereotypes since the beginning. But how does a Chevy seem to an active youngster? Well, it's a time of make-believe, with the whole world to set the scene. TV was especially full of images of the Old West in programs as well as commercials. Movies and TV painted a caricature and singular view of what Indians were like and rarely used Native American actors. Besides movies and TV, most Americans only know Indians through corporate advertising and sports mascots. In countless instances, the Native American image would be heavily exploited, including the blatantly offensive, historically inaccurate, and highly sexualized notion of the Indian princess. Beginning in the 1970s, as a counterpoint to the stereotyped Hollywood Indian of many of the classic westerns of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, more movies would become sympathetic to Native Americans and would attempt to portray Indians somewhat more realistically. Even so, the underlying theme was that of the white man as the hero. 
either in the story or the non-native casting choices. The subtle message was that the white hero usually became a better Indian than the Indians. This myth has been perpetrated upon indigenous peoples throughout literary history. Right up through Avatar, a film that was sympathetic to indigenous peoples. But it was the white guy who figured out how to get Torek Makto, the big bird. The truth is, there have always been plenty of Native American heroes and their stories waiting to be told and recognized by a country that has often preferred to forget about them. The treaty story, of course, begins before there was a United States because it was nation to nation amongst the Native nations and the European nations. The story is told. Since the founding of this country, the U.S. government has made and broken over 500 treaties with various Indian tribes all across our nation. Then there was Custer. And of course, everyone knew about Little Bighorn and Custer's last stand, and how valiantly the cavalry had fought against overwhelming odds to become iconic figures in American history. Not much is mentioned about the complexities to the buildup of the Battle of Little Bighorn with the many broken treaties and how the discovery of gold on Lakota land led to a giant swindle against them by the government, or how they had been warned by Crazy Horse to turn around because they were greatly outnumbered. My grandfather, White Bull, was in a, lived in a village, Cherry Creek Village. And my other grandfather, White Feather, lived away from them, about a mile, mile and a half or so, north of uh, uh, Cherry Creek Village. And that's where the village was, the oldest village, Indian village in, in the Sioux Nation. And he was living there. So they told me everything about the Battle of Little Big Horn. They would go out on um, Tuea, they used to call it Tuea. They are kind of scouting around for enemy and so forth. And one day they, they, they see the cavalry coming. Crazy Horse sent a scout, scout out to them and told them, uh, you better not come any closer because you're coming to your death. Pehihaska means Custer. But he kept coming anyway. So he decided to get ready. And I didn't want the storybooks that said that that white bull had killed Custer. So I asked him, Grandpa, I said in Indian, I said, Grandpa, did you kill Custer like they said he did? And he kind of chuckled. Oh, oh, oh. He said, Oh, he said, Oh, means heck, just the same as saying, Hell no, heck no, you know. They all looked alike, so we don't we don't know which one is Custer. But we killed them all, he says. So somebody did, and so he was telling the truth, you know. But the storybook tells him that he killed him, but he said he denied it. He said he did. He didn't know who killed him because they he had his hair cut and everything. And, he looked like the rest of them, he said. It was only after an American Indian movement uprising in the 1970s that most non-natives became aware of the Wounded Knee Massacre and how the 7th Cavalry, Custer's old unit, had killed mostly women and children and the elderly. 
perhaps partly in zealous revenge for the humiliating defeat at Little Bighorn. But that night, they all went to one to knee, Bigfoot band, Spotted Hill, Bigfoot and all them, High Hawks, a lot of them. And that night, they all camped in one to knee. And next morning, the cavalry was there too. And they made they, they made them all lined up, boys and girls. At the end, there was an old man, kind of mute, hard hearing. He had a blanket. He hide that rifle inside the blanket. Somehow that rifle got fired, <laughs> and that's what started. And they all, all the elderly. The people that all got massacred there, and all the young little kids, 14 years old, maybe 20 years old, like that. The elderly told him to run back this way to Shine River. Yap, yap, kick up, go, go back. And all the elderly people, they all got killed there. The native bodies were thrown into mass graves while the cavalry were celebrated as heroes for their victory against the mostly unarmed Indians. The history books would neglect to mention that in their frenzy, many of the soldiers shot each other and some of those casualties would be awarded the Medal of Honor, a fact that is remembered to this day by the Lakota. And today, the United States government, today, they never did apologize yet. They never did apologize. They never did. In 1990, Congress passed a resolution expressing regret for the massacre. The word apology was stricken from the draft resolution and a request to declare Wounded Knee a national monument was denied. History has always reinforced the myth of the vanishing Indian, as if Native Americans were part of a culture that somehow disappeared long ago. Of course, they didn't. They were forcibly relocated to reservations and subjected to what can only be described as attempted cultural genocide. So historical trauma is still with us. And that's, but that's, when Standing Rock happened, the, all of this, this trauma and saying, hey, we, this, we're gonna go, we're gonna, we gotta go support them at all costs. Standing Rock united hundreds of tribes from North and South America, along with non-native supporters from all over the world including members of the International Indigenous Youth Council, whose members represent the seventh generation. Todas las cosas vienen marcado en la profecía de los mayas eterno. La profecía de los mayas y de los Hopis es el mismo. Los del centro nos hacen unir el águila del norte. Con el cóndor del sur. Nos encontraremos con nuestros hermanos. Porque somos uno. Con los dedos de la mano. Ricos y pobres. Blancos y negros. Indígenas, no indígenas. Somos uno con la paz de la tierra. The rise of the seventh generation and the mending of the sacred hoop of the Lakota were the visions of Crazy Horse and Black Elk. It's like a spiritual awakening. Where we're stronger than ever, that's what I see, because we've been through all of this and we're still standing, and we're still trying to stand for what's right, and this is what we're here for. 
This is what we were created for. This is what Tukashla gave us was his land. They, he asked us to take care of it. He asked us to take care of his, you know, our mother. And that's what we're here to do. Connection with the earth. Connection with all the four-leggeds and the winged and the water. And the, you know, the thunder beings and the energy. What this earth is capable of and respecting it, people actually see that. And they also are starting to see that money doesn't last forever. Neither do some of the fossil fuels that they're wanting to take. The reality of the teaching of nature was oppressed and <clears throat> the connections of the elements was oppressed. And so now, it's, now it began again. And it's gonna happen again very powerful. Each of us is put here in this time and this place to personally decide the future of mankind. Did you think the Creator would create unnecessary people in a time of such terrible danger? Know that you yourself are essential to this world. Understand both the blessing and the burden of that. You are desperately needed to save the soul of this world. Did you think you were put here for something less? In a sacred hoop of life, there is no beginning and no ending. It is said that Standing Rock was the greatest gathering of different tribes in one place in history. But there is another, more somber gathering in the cemetery of the Carlisle Indian School dating back to 1879. We're starting to change, and I feel that uh, there's, of course, a lot more things to do and to work on. When we talk about this, it is not to impart a sense of guilt, it's to impart a sense of freedom from denial. So by, and, and when you look at that trauma response, the Native people's um, objective is to heal the non-Native people's objective is to come out of denial. And when these folks can come out of denial and these ones can start to heal, then they can start to come together on common ground. Let's say some guy goes out and cheats on his wife and then wants to reconcile the relationship. It's not going to get anywhere if he says, forget about it, it all happened in the past. So he's got to say, I did that, it was wrong, I'm sorry mean it and be believed. So as a nation, we need to start with acknowledgement, education, information. Children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. In the 1870s, the federal government, partly in order to meet its obligations to educate Aboriginal children, began to play a role in the development and administration of these schools. Two primary objectives of the residential school system. 
So we have to be brave enough to experience a little discomfort. I think we need to stop being defensive. We need to stop being guilty. And we just need to learn how to listen. You know, it's not like we should be beating everybody up for the sins of their ancestors. It's understanding how things got the way they were, how things are the way they are, so we can make things different, understand one another, and get along. We, we need to reconcile and heal. And frankly, everybody needs some healing. And it would also be reasonable to say that if we can have a generation of people that take this on and heal it, that you're doing the healing work for the ancestors as well. Like that you can, if it works in one direction, it can work in the other direction also. Just listen to the stories. If you could just learn how to listen, you could learn anything as a culture. I do think acknowledgement's a good place to start. As a microcosm for a process, I, I feel like acknowledgement, education, you know, and then hope and action. And we need to be attentive to all of those things. For Native people and for other people of color, we have a distinct role in all of this too. If we're too angry, we chase everybody away from the table and then we're eating alone. But if we go too slow, we lose all of our own people because there's no justice. It's just a pat on the back, feel good experience. So we have to keep persistent enough and patient enough to affect meaningful change. You know, internally Native people have a lot of work to do too. There's four pillars that prop up oppression. Only one of them is an external group keeping somebody down. And the other three happen inside of the oppressed communities. Internalized oppression, this is the high suicide rate and things we have in Native communities. And then lateral oppression, so that's the crabs in the bucket. Every time one's crawling out, the others grab his hind legs and pull him back in. You know, and it's intra-oppressed group oppression where you will see homophobia and racism and things like that within Native communities, all of which serves to prop up the supremacy of white people. It's important to realize that if people of color rise and actually finish high school and get jobs, they're not taking jobs away from a white person. They are growing the pie for all people. When your neighbor's house value goes up, your house value goes up. When the teacher can work faster with your neighbor's kids, they can work faster with your kids too. That in fact, everybody who becomes a productive load-bearing member of society reduces the burden for everyone else. We all do better when we all do better. But if you've come here to fix me, or to do an act of charity, then you're wasting your time. If you've come here because you realize that your liberation and my liberation are inextricably linked, let's get started.